Wow. I mean, just wow. We've just witnessed an Unai Emery masterclass on the occasion of his 50th game in charge of our club as he defeated for the first time in his managerial career a Pep Guardiola team. And in the process, set a multi-generational record of 14 straight league wins at Fortress Villa Park, which dates back to the 30s. And the best thing about the result and the performance is that nobody, and I mean nobody watching that game, could say that we didn't fully deserve it. And the only crap part about it is that we don't get to savor it for a week. We're straight back at it on Saturday against Arsenal, which I'll preview later. But first, let's review, and this is not a drill, Aston Villa 1, Manchester City 0. Just before we delve into what might be the match of the season when all is said and done, I want to say a quick thank you to Gary and Brian Prescott, huge Villa fans and very dedicated viewers of this show. I can't imagine what was happening in those households upon the final whistle sounding Wednesday night, but Gary knows that I'm a huge fan of match programs. Ever since I was little, I always found it really cool that sports teams would publish magazines for just that game with photos and puzzles and games and articles, like a little historical archive. Do people still get jazzed up about programs these days? I bet Wednesday nights will be a collector's item. Regardless, Gary sent over a bundle of really big programs from games that I remember like yesterday. So now I'm going to have an entire holiday's worth of scouring through every single page of these beautiful archives. Thank you so much, Gary. And to you, Brian, and your family, Merry Christmas. I know these kinds of things are fun to debate over a pint at the pub, but clearly that game, one for the ages, one that we will never forget, jumps to the very top of Unai Emery masterclass type performances since he arrived a little over a year ago, eclipsing the Newcastle 3-0 win down to second, which I was fortunate enough to see live. And that's not the reason why I say it was second, because that was one of the most comprehensive performances under our new manager. And then third, I think, has to be the 6-1 over Brighton and Hove Albion for various reasons. But these things are immaterial. What matters to you and me is that we are enjoying the view from our perch in third place in the Premier League, just four points behind the leaders Arsenal who are coming here next. Welcome officially to the Holy Trinity show where I dissect the three key issues or moments that defined Aston Villa 1, Manchester City 0, and there's no chance Samir Gaby, our senior correspondent, would miss this tilt wearing his 1989-90 Hummel track top, gathering footage including scenes in the Holt thanks to Leon Bailey. The key numbers were interesting because apart from XG and the shots, it looked relatively even, but successful dribbles were really one-sided. How much did the visitors miss Jeremy Doku or potentially Jack Grealish? And how good were we at driving the ball forward individually apart from passing? I think that was clearly a factor in this game. Big, big issue, arguably top three material, and I alluded to this in the Manchester City preview during the Bournemouth show, and we'll never know what might have happened in this game otherwise, but those are three pretty big omissions from the visiting squad in Rodri, Jeremy Doku, and Jack Grealish. Now, the Villa boys from Aston can only play and worry about the team that's put in front of them. They have no control over suspensions and injuries. And by the way, the team that was put in front of them is still more than capable of easily beating the majority of Premier League sides, even away from home. But this game was crying out for a doku could he have caused Ezri Konza more trouble on the villa right there left every time Rodri's out Manchester City seems to lose which was a big topic of discussion among pundits but you know what that's football that's where the game landed and you know Rodri maybe 
maybe don't take so many yellows and maybe Jack Grealish don't kick the ball away. Crazy issue, which gave me a real jolt of belief just before kickoff, was when referee John Brooks arrived in the tunnel as the players were waiting to come out because Aston Villa has never lost a game when John Brooks has been appointed in charge. And mercifully, thankfully, this game will be remembered for Aston Villa's performance and not some kind of contentious refereeing decisions. In fact, I can't remember a single decision that was contentious in that entire game. It might have been one of John Brooks's easiest games in his career. Big issue, major issue, and a huge factor, great discussion as well. If I were to push you up against the wall right now and say, pick a man of the match... Who would you choose and what would your criteria be? I know a lot of people would defer to Leon Bailey because he got the match winner and he was very involved in the front third. It might actually be harder to say, okay, go up and down the 11 and pull out a name that is not in contention for that honor. And that is a good sign. When all 11 of your players are contributing in a meaningful way and the substitutes for that matter, so laser focused, tactically astute, technically proficient, heart, courage, desire, all of those things at once, you're going to win more football matches. And now Villa has another reference point to validate that what they're doing is working. That, my friends, is cult like. Big issue number three Pep pipped. I find some of these facts astounding. Pep Guardiola's career spans 535 games across Europe's big five leagues, and in that entire time, he has never presided over a side that has had just two attempts on target in a match. Think about that for a moment. 535 games, and on Wednesday, Villa held City to the lowest shot total in his career. Meanwhile, they had 22 attempts on goal. That's the joint most ever under Pep Guardiola, and they recovered the ball 13 times in the front third. That, too, has never happened before in his career across Europe's top five leagues. I'm also pretty certain that he's never been involved in a game where his team has not had at least one corner. They had zero on Wednesday. And now he has to avoid... His first ever five-game winless run in the league, and he'll need to do that by beating Luton Town on Sunday. I mean, this is record-breaking stuff here and an all-time effort by our little Aston Villa. But how? How did we pull off such a feat? I've mentioned on the show before how much it irks me when people try to talk tactics and masterclasses because... They don't even know what the plan is because they're not in the classroom or on the training ground with the players and coaches to even know if the plan was successful or not. Any guy can come and draw lines and X's and O's over game footage and say, well, here's what did happen. Well, yeah, we know what did happen, but how did we know that those were the plans that were being executed? What I saw was a heavy emphasis on a mid-block and then picking moments to press, which they did so effectively. I could watch the game five times and still not pick up the triggers on when Villa was supposed to press. That's way above my pay grade. But obviously it was working because they recovered the ball 13 times in the front third, City's defensive third. That just doesn't happen to that team. Most people simply don't realize how hard it is to pull off an effective press over and over again against a supremely talented group of players with the technical ability to get out of jams. And this is where Unai Emery's attention to detail and the repetition and the hard work on the training ground has paid off because his players know exactly when to go collectively. Can't just be one, it has to be all three. And they aren't just diving in like headless chickens. There's a coordinated manner to how they're closing in on the ball. Pep Guardiola said afterwards, they were the better team. They deserve to win, speaking about Aston Villa. And most importantly, they are 100% capable of winning the league. Pep's own words. And we saw it time and time again, where we were winning the ball back high up the field. We were putting Manchester City under enormous pressure and not giving away silly fouls. 
That comes down to the impeccable work that was done on Monday and Tuesday at Bodymore Heath. And again, I'm not in the dressing room. I don't know what Pep Guardiola's approach was for Manchester City. I think Villa wanted out of possession to execute a mid-block, which Pep actually alluded to. I do think, however, that Pep wanted to absolutely smother and snuff out Douglas Louise and maybe even allow Bubakar Kamara to have more of the ball because maybe they assumed that he was more likely to turn the ball over and the opposite happened. Kamara was absolutely silky in this game and Yuri Tielemans too was really effective. I'm not generally a big fan of flicks and tricks unless they serve a legitimate purpose, but our Belgian ace actually got out of quite a few jams by using some pretty clever technical improvisation. Big moment number two, Debu's double dip. There could have been a big moment early in this game. Within five minutes, actually, John McGinn picks out Leon Bailey with a big switch, and I actually thought Bailey's first touch took him away from goal a little bit. And unfortunately, his shot was blocked by Ederson. Maybe he didn't see Ollie Watkins to his left because if he squared it up, it might have been a tap-in. Could have been a big moment, but from the corner, John McGinn slips through a beautiful pass for Pau Torres, who nearly bends it into the top corner. And so it's the Brazilian goalkeeper too, Emmy Martinez nil. Five minutes later, and the Manchester City we all know and fear broke down the field and created two very good chances, both from Erling Haaland. Are they considered clear-cut chances? I would say so. Have we seen Manchester City score on similar chances to those? Yes, we have. Keeping in mind, as I mentioned earlier, these were the only two chances and shots on target they had in the game. Holland's first effort is smashed at, let's be honest, a very good height for Emmy Martinez to get a mid on it, but then they recycle it and they get a second phase cross and Erling Holland from the doorstep gets a header that again, Emmy Martinez is equal to. Now, were either of those saves the most spectacular in Emmy Martinez's Aston Villa career? No, but they did set a tone somehow. And I'm honestly starting to think that his on-field presence, his personality is becoming so big that attackers are second-guessing or rushing or maybe trying to be a little bit too fine. And as an attacker, you can't do those things. You can't think. You must react and be instinctive but when you've got this big eight foot octopus in a black jersey flailing around in front of you maybe you are starting to think a little bit or trying to do things a little bit too fine and to finally earn another clean sheet after eight unsuccessful attempts in the league and to win the goalkeeping duel against one of the other truly elite keepers on the planet a brazilian no less somehow felt very symbolic for me on Wednesday night. And I've been talking about Emmy Martinez an awful lot in recent shows. It feels to me like his prominence is actually growing, that his stature is increasing despite having achieved something that so few players will ever achieve in their life, winning a World Cup, being named the Yashin Trophy winner. How high is his confidence right now? And for that matter... Imagine being an outfield player for Villa and having him guarding your goal. Does that give you the confidence to maybe go on and take a risk now and again to go for games? And how about his reaction afterwards? That was immense. I can only imagine what must be going through his mind right now with the next one on the horizon, especially given how that same fixture played out last year. Just before we get to number one, I think Paul Hansaker of 24-7 Services is still celebrating as we speak. He was in the whole end celebrating with everybody else last night. This is a guy who, along with his dad, Big Ron, has followed the Villa since about the late 70s to every big game and I'm betting that one is now climbing up the list from Wednesday night so like the rest of us he is on cloud nine uh, properly harnessed and tethered by the way as per 24 7's very high safety standards so like everybody in the country who wears and bleeds claret and blue Paul is skipping into work ready to repair, replace, replenish, renew, repaint, even on three hours sleep, and hopefully bump into a miserable blue nose to banter with. Do you know his painting and decorating team 
can do pretty much anything you want in a room. Imagine getting the young Villa fan in your family a custom Aston Villa paint job, better than this chop job I did. What a Christmas present that would be. Well, you can do it, and it all starts with a phone call. And the number one big moment that defined Villa 1 Manchester City nil, Leon's lash. Ho-hum, just another Leon Bailey goal in front of the whole tent. And incredibly, in the last 11 games that Leon Bailey has scored, Villa's won 10, and the only blemish was the 2-2 draw with Bournemouth over the weekend. Was it a big shout to start Bailey over Musa Diaby? I mean, who would question Unai Emery's eyeballs at this stage? But this Leon Bailey, the one we saw on Wednesday night, is exactly the player we were all hoping for when he signed from Bayer Leverkusen. Since then, though, through injury or through perhaps just not the right coaching, as it turned out, we all wondered... Is there more that Leon Bailey can give? And he answered that question on Wednesday night, and he has under Unai Emery, because he created two chances. He hit the target three times. He was always an outlet. He was everywhere, and at times it felt like he had the ball on a string. The goal actually started with an accurate long ball, one of 31 we played on the night, which is incredible. That's 20 yards or more. And we did it so successfully. The ball bypassed so many players. Some call it a packing rate in football. How many players does the ball bypass? And in this case, it was Diego Carlos who found Yuri Tielemans. Now, a lot of people say, why isn't Ezri Konza playing at center back? Why is he at right back? Well, I think it's because... Diego Carlos has this in his locker. I think it's one of the reasons why we signed him, to be able to find that ball. Yuri Tielemans was the intended target, and he manages to just win a duel to get enough of it to Leon Bailey, and that's when the Jamaican does the rest. At his very best, the ball seems to just stick to Leon Bailey's feet, and he can skip away or sprint away, where defenders then have to decide, do you back off or do you bite? If you back off, he cuts in. If you bite, you might give away a foul or he skins you. Now on the goal, I think he was simply trying to create a little pocket of space closer to the goal than the one he tried in the first half, the one along the ground. And then the second one he tried on Ederson, which was the long bomb he was trying to put high that the Brazilian tips over the crossbar. Ollie Watkins pulls out wide to offer a visual distraction. The city defenders too disciplined to bite there. But then Bailey pulls off a fantastic chop back. And the irony here is that he hits the ball with his less preferred right foot. And I think maybe he was given that little pocket of space and they backed off just that little bit because they were only too happy to show him onto his right foot. And then... Some good fortune followed. You know the expression, if you don't buy a ticket, you can't win the lottery. Well, when Ruben Diaz stuck out a foot and the ball deflected off of it, that was the equivalent of our winning numbers coming up. And how many times has that deflection gone against us? Well, as recently as the Spurs game with Diego Carlos. I remember the West Ham home game last year when Ezri Konza stuck out a lazy leg. Well, that ended up being the lone goal in another loss under Steven Gerrard. This time it went in our favor, and when that ball hit the back of the net, every Villa fan around the world was starting to sense that this could be happening. And by the way, Leon Bailey has already passed all of his best work in Villa colors. He is going to have a career year. We're not even halfway through the season yet. I just love doing this after a win, especially one like that. And just look, just gaze at this stat here 21 out of a possible 21 points earned at villa park incredible we've improved our record against the top six to nine now out of a possible 15 points scored first for the eighth time this season and improved our second half plus minus to plus seven plus 14 on the season now and maybe most satisfyingly no we couldn't get a clean sheet against fulham or luton but we could against Manchester City for number three on the season. Up next, incredibly, the last team to have defeated Villa 
at Fortress Villa Park. I mean, Premier League script writers, bravo. That was 14 wins ago, and now here they come again on Saturday in what was going to be a battle between Basque managers, but Arteta, receiving a yellow card at Luton, will be banished from the touchline for this one. I can't believe that a manager can have already accumulated five yellow cards at this early point in the season, which speaks to Arteta's very fiery touchline temperament. The fact that he won't be in the technical area I don't think hurts us necessarily, and we would like every edge possible as we go into this game because this is a chance at redemption, and I can't help but think that what happened in this fixture last year will still be on the minds of many. Unai Emery was furious after that game because his team did not manage the match. I think they have grown a lot. They will have learned a lot. But this is a big game for Arsenal because with their win at Luton in the last moments of that game and then City losing at Villa Park on Wednesday, here's a chance for them to really put some buffer space between them and Manchester City. And that's how they're looking at things. They are table gazers, as I've said on previous shows. This is going to be epic. The big obvious question heading into Saturday for both sides, really, is how much rotation will occur in a relatively short week. And the interesting dynamic is that Arsenal is on three days rest heading into the weekend, whereas Aston Villa is just on two. Arsenal played across town in Luton on Tuesday, Villa playing on Wednesday. John McGinn was absolutely immense, particularly in the first half on Wednesday. By the time the second half rolled around, there were some signs here and there that he might be running on fumes a little bit. You can tell sometimes with the passing, but there is no chance our captain is going to miss out on the game on Saturday. Might he go the full 90 minutes, though? And we do have options to bring in fresh legs in the form of Musa Diaby, Jacob Ramsey, Alex Moreno, and Matty Cash. That's the dynamic I'm curious about. Will Unai Emery freshen things up? Because it's not just about Saturday. It's also about the rest of this very busy month in front of us. Oh, it was one for the ages and one that I will never forget for as long as I live. And thanks for all your videos and photos that you sent because it made me feel like I was right there and part of all the celebrations. My heart was pumping out of my chest near the late stages of the game. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a shame we couldn't just bask in the afterglow of it all for a little bit longer and enjoy the view from our heady perch of third in the Premier League. But no, we have to get straight back up and face the next monster in front of us. And I think if you asked Aston Villa fans prior to this week, which of these two games would you much prefer to win? I think the majority would say Arsenal. Who would that be a fun team to turn over? But now we are in the position to actually do both. And I can't wait until Saturday. Be well. Strap yourself in. And as always, up the mighty villa! <laughs> <laughs>